Education Librarian at Cleveland State. Um, and I'm one of the conference organizers. Um, I am very happy to introduce Joanna Blair, who, my notes just disappeared. Joanna Blair is a librarian from Centennial College, which is in Toronto, Ontario, in Canada. Um, she is a liaison for the School of Engineering Technology and Applied Science and a Scholarly Communications Librarian. Her professional interests are primarily related to information literacy, outreach, and assessment. And Joanna will be giving a talk on open question sets and exercises, tips for finding and creating. Um, we ask that you keep your microphone muted unless the presenter asks you to unmute yourself, but I think um, she may be asking for some engagement in chat. And then we'll have a question and answer after her presentation. Great, thanks so much, Ben. And uh, welcome everyone. Thanks so much for coming today. I'm gonna share my screen. And then I will launch in. All right, got my two screens going. So bear with me, uh, just give me a thumbs up that you can see. Excellent, thank you. All right, uh, so I will reintroduce myself. I'm Joanna Blair, Scholarly Communications Librarian uh, and liaison at Centennial College. It's a small, uh, well, it's medium-sized community college in Toronto. There's five campuses in and around the Toronto area. Uh, and I developed this session specifically for my community um, because so many folks were saying one of the barriers to, to creating or, or adopting open resources were finding that ancillary material. So they didn't want to give up the question sets and the PowerPoint slides that come with the traditional textbook. So, so I developed this session to, to, so that I had in my back pocket the places where you can go to look for those question sets. And I could, I could present that to, uh, to folks. Uh, and also so that there were some, some tools that I could present for co-creating with your students question sets so that that barrier wouldn't exist anymore. Uh, and I was hoping originally to, to deliver this session to my, to my community uh, during Open Education Week, but there was a, a labor action in Ontario uh, so, so that actually has been postponed until next week. So I'm, I'm doing it a little bit in reverse today. All right. Let me get started here. Uh, and I wanted to start by actually positioning myself uh, geographically. I am uh, just, I'm just a kilometer north of the city of Toronto and Toronto, this is a map of, well, part of North America. Uh, is, the, is in the northern shore of Lake Ontario. And, and I put a dot there, which is my approximation of Cleveland. So the southern shore of, uh, of Lake Erie there. I, and I wanted to acknowledge uh, that I am on the traditional lands of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat people. Um, and uh, I'm now on the land that is, is home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. And I'm a grateful guest and treaty 13 territory. I did look on nativeland.ca before uh, earlier this week, and Cleveland actually is, is also the traditional territories of uh, the Mississaugas. Uh, so, so the folks who were saying where they were, where they were from, if you happen to know the traditional lands that you are sitting on, uh, it looks like we have people from all over the world here. So I love that. If you want to put that in the chat box as well, that would be great to know. All right, but I will launch into my content. So today, uh, the learning outcomes that I have, I want to be able to point, point you to specific OER repositories that are strong for question sets uh, and assessments so that, so that if faculty come to you or if a colleague comes to you and says, oh, I'm looking for um, you know, questions for, for a, a textbook, you can point them to those resources and you will feel comfortable going and searching those resources. And then I want to do a second part of the session, discuss best practices when it comes to co-creating test questions with your students. Okay, so there will be a couple of activities. You'll have a chance to search different repositories, and then we're gonna try co-creating uh, questions at the end. So hopefully we'll have, we'll have time for that. And we've got a really good, uh, good number of people here. So honestly, with, with 72 people in the room, imagine how many questions we could, we could develop. Okay. So I want to start by talking about repositories that are really strong for open textbooks. Uh, and I think for me as a librarian, a lot of what I do, I will help faculty find resources to replace their, their textbook, but I don't always go that second step and look for the ancillary resources. 
So I want to start with, and when I teach to, to finding resources, I usually divide it into repositories that are good for open textbooks and then repositories that are good for uh, other learning objects like, like you know, lecture notes or um, videos or PowerPoint slides. So, so I'm going to start with the open textbooks repositories and the ones that are particularly strong for question sets. So the two that I want to point out to initially are OpenStax and LibreText, and these are probably rep repositories that you are all familiar with. They've been, uh, been around for um, 15 years, maybe, uh, and they are good for sort of the high enrollment courses, those first year courses like intro, intro biology and algebra. These are fantastic resources for that. And what I didn't realize uh, before developing this session is they are also very, very strong for those ancillary materials. So it's not just the open textbook, it's some of the, um, the question sets and the PowerPoint slides. But the trick is you need to register for an instructor account. So, so I want to encourage everyone to register for their instructor account. It took me all of, of you know, an hour to get access to, to these resources. And I'll just show you. So for OpenStax, they have about 70 textbooks uh, and not for, not for all of their textbooks, but for many of their textbooks, once you have the instructor account, you will get cartridges for your learning management system integration. You will get test banks uh, and answer guides for, in, for instructors, PowerPoint slides, Google Forms, okay? But the trick is to get that instructor account. And I'll just show you, I should be logged in. So this is going to open a chemistry textbook in OpenStax. All right, so you can see I'm logged in here. And anyone will have access to the book details and the table of contents and the content. But what I have now is the instructor resources, okay, where I can uh, download materials for my LMS. I can uh, access PowerPoint slides. I can access solutions manuals and supplemental te test items. And I'll just show you here, uh, it's saying since many instructors use these questions in graded assignments, uh, they're actually asking that you don't post these questions. And when you download them, you'll actually see it's a copyright symbol. You are, you are invited to use them, uh, but not invited to, to remix, re repost. Okay, which makes sense. So this is this is why uh, they aren't front and center. So you can't you can't necessarily um, find them as obviously as you would find other open open resources because we are trying to protect them from being posted too too widely. So you do have to dig a little bit. You might have to go through that extra step of getting an account to download them. All right. And this is just my, my screenshot. So folks not watching this presentation will be able to uh, know what I'm talking about. Uh, the other thing I wanted to, or sorry, the, the other repository I wanted to point to that were particularly strong, was particularly strong is LibreText. Okay, so, so I think most open textbooks, you will often find a set of um, formative assessments, uh, ass suggested assignments, and, and LibreText will do this as well. Uh, some texts will invite you to contact the author for text banks. So again, they're not making the test bank open in the traditional sense, but the, the test banks are in fact available if you, if you contact the author. And I will show, show you an example of that. But the other thing I want to mention while I'm on this slide is that the instructor account, uh, again, if you register for, for instructor account, you will have access to a homework system. And this is, this is honestly like uh, an internal learning management system with more questions that you can then uh, mix and match and, and assign to students. So I'm just going to click into my example here. There's a few, a few resources on LibreText that I wanna point out specifically for folks who are looking for questions. And I just saw saw my frame freeze. Am I am I lagging at all? No, you're good. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right. So I'm in a chemistry textbook. I'm a I'm a science librarian, so I tend to focus on the sciences. And I just want to show you some some language here, saying in addition, and and actually I'm in a chemistry textbook looking at specific exercises, but uh, but there's language here to saying in addition to these publicly available questions, access to private problem banks. Uh, for use in exams and homework are available to faculty when you when you contact the the um, the author administrator. 
So, so look for language like that. And the other thing I want to encourage folks to do is, is actually reach out to the authors. Even if you don't see language like that, there may be uh, ancillary material that they just don't want to make public because students will do what students do once, once this, um, once this material is, is public. So, so sometimes you have to dig a little bit. That's one of the, the, uh, the messages I want to communicate. And I also mentioned that LibreText has that, that homework system, the ADAPT homework system. Once you have the instructor account, you can go to the ADAPT homework system where you will find more questions that you can, you can mix and match. Uh, so you have to download your, your course. And, and then once you're in, you can start, you can start using these, these homework questions. Um, I don't know if I want to wait for this to load. There we go. So within each of these, these um, chapters, you will find a set of homework questions that you can, that you can play around with. Uh, sorry, that was a lot of clicking in. My, my screenshot probably would have, would have done better. Uh, there we go. So I've got my set of test questions here. Okay, so the other thing I want to show you is there is actually a searchable test bank within LibreText. Uh, so again, this is accessible with your instructor account. So under all questions, and this is this is multidisciplinary. So this will be their entire bank of, of questions for all of their their texts. Um, and actually, I, I shouldn't say that it, this isn't their entire bank of questions, but this is a bank of questions that applies to all of their texts. So. It, um, you will, you can, you can certainly do a, um, a search for your subject, but I just want to show you, this is a bank of 106,000 questions that, that folks can access. Uh, and I just want to point out that, that many of them are H5P. I'm going to talk about H5P in more detail later, uh, but there are other technologies. These questions come in, but they are, they are reusable. Okay. Back to my slides to keep me on track. All right. So your take home, once you register for an instructor account, you will have access to a lot more of these resources. Okay, there's the question bank. All right, so that, that was quick introduction to OpenStax and LibreText for, for questions. The other one I wanna to point to is Lumen Learning. And this is, a, um, this is a site that provides open textbooks, but there, it's a freemium model. There is, there is ancillary material, but there's a student fee associated with it. So everyone is welcome to use their open textbooks, uh, they're CC licensed, but if you want access to that, that ancillary material, there's a student fee uh, and it can't even, they, they won't even allow it for individual students. You have to register a class. And what I have read is it's around $20 um, per student. And they recommend this model for, for institutions that charge a, can charge a course material fee. So if you're looking to reduce the cost of a, you know, a $200 textbook and bring that down uh, and ancillary material is your barrier, this might be an option for you as long as your, your institution can charge a, a course material fee. And, and obviously $20 isn't, isn't much for, uh, for, for textbook access. And I shouldn't even say textbooks access, but the, the access to ancillary material. That's a pretty good bargain for students these days. That's why I have the, the asterisk there because there is a fee. All right, the last two repositories I wanted to point to, uh, Pressbooks Directory and Open Textbook Libraries. These ones I pointed to because they are associating questions with the textbooks. So I am going to show you Pressbooks Directory and uh, I, I, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, with Pressbooks. It is a platform for publishing open educational uh, texts. It's widely used. And I just wanna show you from the Pressbooks directory, you can certainly do a search uh, for your text or for a text on your topic. There's over 3000 books, but you can also limit to textbooks that have H5P activities. So I have done a search here where I am limiting to texts with uh, more than 25 H5P activities. And again, I'm, I'm assuming some, some degree of knowledge with, with H5P, but for those who, who aren't um, familiar with it, it is a software to design questions. So you can do drag, drag and drop activities, multiple choice. Um, it's, it's a very powerful software uh, and it's also designed for reuse. So you can embed it 
pretty much anywhere uh, for librarians out there. You can embed it in LibGuides, you can embed it in press books, you can embed it in, uh, in Google sites. Uh, my, the LMS system at my institution allows you to embed it. So it's, it's a really um, powerful way of sharing questions and, and making your resources interactive. And you know what? I am going to link into it because I want to show you an H5P activity. Um, so I've, I've done my search here for, for writing. I've got my books that have more than 25 H5P activities. And there we go. So I can actually limit my search to books with lots, with lots of questions. And I can just look at my quest, the question sets in those books. Okay, so I've got, I've got my, my list of H5P um, questions here, and you can see some of them are, are image hotspots, so drag and drop, or, or um, uh, let's see, essay questions. And I want to open one of these just to show you what, what the object itself looks like. Okay, so this is an example of an H5P activity. Um, this is a drag and drop, so I can, I can move some of these around. You will, you will also find multiple choice questions. Um, often enough, you will get some feedback. Okay, and then what you get at the bottom, which makes H5P so, so powerful, is the, the ability to reuse this package. So I could take this one question and put it in my LMS if I, if I wanted to. What I get is an H5P file that I can, I can download and then load into my, my, um, my website or my LibGuide. Um, you would need an H5P account, but those are freely available or my institution has, has an institutional um, account as well. The other thing that you will get here, if the author has, oh, there we go, has indicated the rights of use. And best case scenario, the author will always indicate the rights of use. So you know, you can, you can grab it. Sometimes that's not the case, but uh, we will talk about that in a little bit. But even when, when that isn't listed there, uh, that reuse button will, will be available. And if you know the author of the book, you have a place to, to go and um, reach out and say, can I reuse? Okay. Oh, and I didn't realize that. Someone is saying H5P means HTML5 package. I did not realize that. Thank you. And that's I, I'm sure other other folks on the um, in the session can appreciate. You know, there's to all things open. There's a little bit of technology learning that that comes with it. All right. Okay. Last one that I want to mention is Open Textbook Library, and I'm not going to do a search there, but I do want to mention that Open Textbook Library has has about a thousand textbooks, and they they have a place for ancillary material within the record itself. So you, when you were searching in Open Textbook Library, you will know if there is ancillary material associated with that textbook. And it's also a little um, plug, a little reminder for, for authors that if you, are, if you have adopted this book and you're developing ancillary material, you can use this platform to share it with the world. All right. And that's something that, that I'm going to mention several times during this session that uh, there is an opportunity to wh whatever you develop uh, for you to share it back with the community. Okay. All right, so some of the limitations, so certainly technology is, is one of them, uh, but the most, the most open material that's out there, I'd say really is for those, um, those high enrollment courses. So anyone who is doing, who is looking for material in, in English or first year calculus, you usually, you're usually successful finding the open material and it, and that's the case uh, for ancillary material as well. There's, there's quite a few question banks for those high enrollment first year courses. It's when you're looking for, you know, pneumatics or uh, elect electrical engineering that you start running into, um, there, there just isn't a lot of material developed yet, but that's, that's the opportunity to develop something specific for your, for your area that works for your population. So we will talk about that um, later on. But I wanna talk about finding ancillary material without, that's not associated with the textbooks. So those are the other uh, repositories that are, that are out there that aren't focused on the textbook. And I wanna point again to the H5P question banks. 
So again, H5P question sets are just, they are booming and uh, there are several places you can go to search specifically for H5P questions. One of them is eCampus Ontario has developed a, a database of questions, H5P, and I will click into it. Uh, and I like I like eCampus Ontario. I think it's a good good display. They have over three thousand questions, and you can see it's still it's still actively um, being used. Folks are are load, loading their questions to it all the time. Uh, you can search by by topic. So I I often teach information literacy on on APA. So here are a set of questions that I can I could use in my class. I can put on my uh, my LibGuide. Uh, and I just want to show you, here we go, this, this example I was looking at. Okay, so, you know, multiple choice questions. Uh, and again, there's the opportunity to download the file, but what's missing here is the license. And this is, this is a bit of an issue with the H5P tool. The default when you create uh, an H5P is no licensed, it's undisclosed license type. Uh, so clearly this, this author wants to share her, her resource. She, she submitted it to this, to this bank, uh, but she did not license it. So what your alternative is, is obviously to contact the author. And there's some information there about contacting the author author. Uh, so there was a question there. Are the questions vetted in any way? Not in this repository. Uh, that's a, that's a good question. Um, no. But because you can you can reuse it, you can generally reuse the questions. You can adapt them and make make your own the questions perfect in the way that you want. All right. So this is searchable by by keyword, by license, by subject, uh, and then you can see quickly which of these are are licensed for reuse. Uh, or undisclosed. So you can limit that way as well. Uh, Libra Studio also has a large question bank. We've already seen the searchable question bank, but they have one that you can browse as well. And this one has about 8,000 questions and it's browsable by subject. So there we go. Uh, there were a couple other question banks out there that I, that I did find. Uh, they're, they are smaller in scope, but Mer Merlot uh, this is one of the OER or open educational resource repositories now has a hub for H5P questions and learning about H5P questions and depositing H5P questions. And then H5P.org, they actually, um, they're saying that coming soon, their, their platform will be searchable for the entire H5P bank of questions. Okay, there is a question. Do I have an integration between H5P um, that allows reporting to Grade Center? Oh, that is a really good question. Uh, and I don't know the answer to that. Um, and that's, yeah, as a librarian, I know all of these tools, but the way the way it connects to Grade Center, because I don't, I don't teach, um, I, I don't know the answer to that. If anyone on the call knows if H5P can connect to Grade Center in your learning management system, please feel free to, to answer the question in, in the chat. Okay, if you are about to run out and start developing H5P, I just wanna show you when you are developing H5P, you need to click on metadata, or if your colleagues are, are developing H5P, um, under metadata, you get to choose a license. So the default is und undisclosed, but you want to, to make sure you choose a CC license. Okay. So we were talking about textbook repositories. These are the repositories with other objects. So um, for example, OER Commons have, has, does have textbooks, but also has lectures and lecture notes and uh, assignments and assessments. And you can filter for all of those. So I wanted to point out OER Commons is very strong for finding question back banks and question sets. Merlot is also strong for, for, for that type of material. You can also limit for quizzes, tests. There's a limit now for H5P. There's a limit for drills and practice and assessment tools. Uh, skills, skills Common is also, uh, also has some filters for quizzes, whoops, quizzes and case studies. And let me go back. Uh, and Oasis is 
it does have some filters uh, to a limited extent. So I, I would start with Merlot and OER Commons if you are just looking for question sets that may not be associated with a textbook. And I have a couple of screenshots just to bring home that, that point that there are a lot of filters available if you are looking for um, homework assignments or assessments. And the other thing I have found with OER Commons is you can actually search for, for question banks. Uh, so there are question banks associated with, with engineering. Sometimes you will find them just the, the set of questions for a specific textbook. Uh, but this is, this is limited at, that, at this point, but I think this is a growth area. So keep checking back, like, like all things open, it, uh, it just keeps growing. Okay, so I have mentioned a lot of resources and I wanted to give you folks time to, if you haven't been, been searching while I was talking, I wanted to give you a chance to, to actually do some searching. So I'm gonna put links to a few of these repositories in the chat and feel free to have a look, search for your topic, uh, see what's available. And if you find something very, very exciting, uh, please put it in the chat. So I'm going to, to give you, I don't know, maybe 90 seconds to, to just click on one of those and, and see what's available, do a search, let the group know if you found, find something exciting. And thank you to, uh, to the moderators who are doing such a great job putting links in the, in the chat for me. I really appreciate it. Also, if you have any questions, feel free to put that in the chat now and I will try to, um, to answer them while we, while we have a, a quick search break. Yeah, so for H5P, I know with our institutional sub subscription or account, we, we can also share questions within, within our institution. Uh, so there's, there's question sets that, um, it just makes it easier to reuse within your LMS. Okay, so I can see Michael is browsing through Pressbooks. Uh, and yeah, try, try using that filter in press books for, for books with the H5P activities. So that's a good question. Someone is asking if you can integrate H5P into press books from an outside source. Or can you only use H5P with Pressbooks if you pay the subscription with H5P? So there is a, a free account available with H5P. Uh, and if you, I know if you copy a Pressbook, so if you, if you duplicate a, a, an open Pressbook, the H5P activities will stay with that Pressbook. So I hope that that answers your questions. All right. I think I'm going to keep moving on. Uh, feel free to, to keep putting questions in the, in the chat. I will try to uh, keep my eye on it. All right. So my other trick, uh, and this, this, I don't usually start with this one, but um, there's nothing wrong with going to Google. Uh, I will do a Google advanced search and, and look for technical writing and, and then throw in a bunch of keywords like exercise or quiz or worksheet or question seat, sheet, filter for usage rights, and then, and then see what comes up. Sometimes that will find some material outside of, of repositories that, that I haven't captured. And I use this in particular when it's, it's a tricky topic like electrical engineering. Um, yeah, yeah, and I think you're right, Kelly, that, that coming up with a specific search is, is your trick there. 
Uh, if you're looking specifically for exercises, um, yeah, use as many keywords, synonyms as, as, as you can come up with. All right. The other tip I have, if you can't find it, reach out to your community. Uh, so tap into the OER networks out there. So we, we saw an example on LibreText of the author saying, go ahead and, and ask me if, uh, if you, want, you want my question sets. I have seen that question on listservs as well. I belong to the Community College Consortium uh, OER listserv, and I have absolutely seen that posted. Does anyone know of, of question banks for X book or this type of book? So, so you can get, you can, there's no harm in asking. Um, and certainly there are community hubs for, for different disciplines and different resources available through OER Commons. So that's another way of sort of reaching, uh, getting together with your community, community to see what is out there. Um, and again, no harm in, in asking the author. Uh, or if you know someone else who has adopted the book, you can reach out to them as well. All right, and I wanted to share our knowledge, uh, our collective knowledge. So I have a Padlet. I will open the Padlet and put the link in the chat. Uh, and what I'm hoping to do here is, is see what your OER networks are. So who would you reach out to, uh, to see, to ask? Uh, and maybe you have some, some great OER listservs that you, you belong to. Just getting this Padlet going. Here we go. So if you want to put in the Padlet your favorite OER network, uh, if there's a Twitter feed, if there's um, a listserv or uh, a disciplinary listserv that you that you belong to and use, feel free to post it here and then we can we can all benefit from our collective knowledge. Colleagues at state level, absolutely. I, I'm I'm amazed in the U.S. at how how folks are working together to meet the um, I guess the state standards. Yeah. Hmm. Yep. Absolutely. So this, and and I would put in here certainly Ontario eCampus Ontario. This is that's one of the um, my provincial sort of advocates for for OER. So reaching out to to folks who are who are active in those communities can sometimes yield those results. Um, so thank you everyone for sharing. It's great. Oh, and they're still coming in. All right, I'm going to jump back into my presentation. Okay, so this, this is the part where, okay, nothing, nothing has worked. I'm really gonna have to start building something myself. Uh, and I want to give you an example and a couple of examples of how you can build it with your students. And this is actually one of the lightning talks was fantastic for uh, giving an example of how this might work as well. And this is all grounded in open pedagogy. Uh, so open pedagogy makes the practice and method of teaching open. So that means both the resources that you are using to educate your students are open, but also the assessments can be open. And there, there is power in that for sure. Uh, so this is one of my favorite quotes from BC campus. When you use open pedagogy in your classroom, you're inviting your students to be part of the teaching process. Uh, and participating in the co-creation of knowledge. And this is a really nice, uh, leveling of the playing field. So, so students are not vessels, they are, they are givers of information as well. Um, 
So one of the things with, with open pedagogy is it really forces you to talk to students about, about open. They need to know what open is uh, and what the implications are for them participating in it. And I also think the, the power in open pedagogy, and every educator in the room knows this, is that we understand material better when we present it to our community. Uh, so, so students will engage with, with information in a different way when they need to create the test for it. So th this, isn't, this isn't something that you are doing to offload your work. Nobody's doing this to offload their work on students. This is a fantastic teaching tool uh, that will show their understanding of the material. Okay, so I have a couple of examples uh, that I will go into, but I want to... Part of, part of open pedagogy is making sure that students know what they're getting into. So the opportunity there is to teach your students about open education. And you might do that by booking a session with a librarian uh, or scaffolding the skills. So start by asking students to find uh, open images for a class project and, and talking about the licenses there. You might lead them to tutorials. You also want to provide a consent agreement so students understand where the content will go. Uh, what happens to, to their work after they, they submit it. Uh, and I have an example of a consent agreement from Centennial College. You would probably have to tweak it a little bit for your instance. And I would, I would always suggest running it by your, your copyright officer or copyright office. Um, the other thing you want to do is provide a, a way for students to opt out of, of making their material open. So, so make, the, make the exercise so that students can hand it in and benefit from the exercise, but also say, I'm not comfortable making it, making it open. Um, not everyone will be, and that's, that's okay. There's still, there's still lots, of, lots of benefits. Okay, so this is an example from the literature of, uh, of faculty working with their students to generate quiz questions. Okay, so at the end of any module of learning, have students work in pairs to design two to five multiple choice questions. They need to defend the question uh, in terms of whether or not it's important or uh, how difficult it is. And students have to choose three distractors. Okay, so one that predicts the kind of mistake a student would commonly make, one that is similar to the correct answer, and one that is clearly wrong, and these should be identified. So this is part of it. You need to teach your students what makes a good quiz question or a multiple choice question. Uh, and that's, that's a good discussion point. So after the questions have been created, exchange with another pair and get that, that, peer, that peer feedback, and then hand it into the instructor who will take the best two to three questions from each set to make, to make a quiz. Uh, this can be used as practice quiz for the class or added to a test bank later on. And this could also be, this, this, the benefit for the students could be they know what quiz questions are coming because they have, they have created them and, and uh, reviewed them. But the benefit could, or sorry, the assignment could also be creating the quiz questions is in fact the assignment and you get graded on that. So, so there's a couple ways of this benefiting the students, but certainly the real benefit is that they are engaging with the material and understanding it at a different level. All right, here's another example from the literature. This is from a, a faculty uh, at Kwantlen University and he is suggesting to scaffold the skills over several weeks. So, so teach them slowly how to develop these, these quiz questions. Uh, so he asks students to write four questions each week. Uh, for the first two weeks, they were only asked to write, write one distractor, okay? And he provided the STEM question and the correct answer and two, two other options. So, so they were learning by, by looking and doing, but not doing everything initially. Uh, for the next two weeks, they wrote two plausible distractors. The, the following week, they, they were in charge of three until finally uh, they were in charge of writing the STEM and the correct answer, as well as all of the distractors. So, so building those skills over several weeks and having opportunities for peer review. Uh, the other thing I want to point out is this, this faculty member did it double blind and used Google Forms. And this is something that came out in the lightning talk as well, that it's, it's really important to keep this material manageable. So, so in a spreadsheet or a form so that, that you know, it's really clear where the correct answer is um, and you can manipulate the information. You can add it to your, uh, your learning management system or, or quickly copy it into H5P. Okay, so I was hoping that we could actually do this activity together and see how quickly we can develop our own question, 
question bank. So I have a pa another Padlet activity. I'm just going to quickly explain it and then I'll put the Padlet link in there. And I can see I'm getting short on time, but I think we can we can fit this in in just a just three or four minutes. So I am basing this on APA in text citations. Uh, and what I'm asking folks to do, I've provided three stems, three stem questions. So the first one says, what is the format for an APA in text citation when the reference has no author? Uh, and if you're not familiar with APA citation, that's okay. I have linked this to the answer sheet. So this is a, the guide at Centennial for, for APA. And I'm, I'm linking you to when, when information is missing. So here we go under author. Uh, it's telling you what the answer is, the title in quotation marks and then year. So I've got, I've got a STEM question for folks whose first name begins with A to H. Uh, and if your first name begins with I to, Q, I to Q, you are in STEM question two. And what you are going to post here, so just by clicking on add a post, you're going to post correct answer, a wildly incorrect answer, and then a distractor that's, that's similar to the correct answer. Okay, so let me put that. Padlet into the chat. Okay, so this is an activity that you can you can use with students uh, as one of those those moments where you're scaffolding skills. So everybody, give it a try. You don't have to put in a name. This is going to be an anonymous exercise. Let's see. Let's see what you can do with a STEM question. What your peers can do with a STEM question. So I will give you a minute to to play around with this. I'm going to look through the chat to see if there's any questions. Oops. Okay, and just pointing out within within two minutes, we've got, you know, three, four, four suggestions. We've got four questions for our question banks, for our question bank. There we go. All right. This is interesting. I'm wondering if, if there's, yeah, no one with the, the first name starting with R, R onward. But, uh, but thank you everyone for participating. And I want you, I want you to think about this, uh, how you could do it in your class or suggest to faculty. So you could find your answer uh, and I, I, will, I would tell students, you know, go to the post above your answer and comment. What do you think, what do you think is, um, is strong with these answers? What do you think could be improved? Uh, this could also be used as, as an opportunity to discuss the, the STEM question itself. What, what about the STEM question is unclear? How would, you, how would you improve it? Okay, so this is one exercise. I also have a suggestion here for a Google form. Uh, that again, this this can be oh, well, I'm actually going to make sure that I open this up for you because this Google form actually uh, incorporates the the consent as part of it. So you've got a STEM question, you've got the capability to if it loads the capability to put in the correct answer, the distractor answers. So you're, you're actually prompting students to, to, um, to put in appropriate distractors. And then you are asking them to give consent. 
So here is my, my form with a STEM question prompts to put in the appropriate multiple choice answers, and then a consent line. Uh, and again, this, this may change depending on what you, you as, a, as an educator want to do with it, but, um, but at least you know that students have either opted in or opted out and are aware of, of where it might go. Uh, and then the responses can go into a spreadsheet uh, that you can then manipulate uh, as you see fit. You can also take this spreadsheet and deposit it. And I am about to wrap it up. Uh, and that was sort of my last message is reminder, deposit your questions. Uh, your community wants to, to benefit from them. Uh, I have an open education week next week uh, at, at my institution that I am plugging a little bit. But if you have questions about anything I have covered, I, I have a couple, couple minutes left uh, to answer questions, but I wanna thank everyone for coming today and, and moderators for, for all of the technology help. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Joanna. Um, at this point, if you want to put a question in the chat, um, Joanna's doing a pretty good job of monitoring the chat herself, so I'm pretty sure she'll just answer. All right, just scrolling down. And I'll, I'll mention now, um, for each of the live talks, there is a Slack channel. The presenters are not obligated to like check in to the Slack after their presentation, but you're all free to keep discussing, to keep sharing resources. And of course the presenters are welcome to um, discuss in the Slack channel afterwards. It's the Slack site will remain open indefinitely. Were there any questions that I missed along the way that anybody wants to repost or, or unmute and, and ask? All right, well, I didn't leave much time for questions, so that's, that's probably just as well. Uh, but thank you again for everyone who participated throughout. I really, um, yeah, appreciated that, that sort of give and take. So yeah, I hope everyone enjoys the rest of the day. And uh, yeah, I'll probably see you at the next session. Thanks, Joanna. Mm -hmm. See pleasure. you all in about 10 minutes at the next session, which is at a different link. So uh, make sure to, to log out of this meeting and log into the next one. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.